If you woke up tomorrow and your job was gone, a tyrant had taken power and a deadly plague were sweeping the world, would you be terrified or would you be ready to see it as an opportunity? In this video, you're going to learn how to live a wealthy, safe, and worry-free life despite the world's unpredictability. How to be anti-fragile, in the words of Nassim Taleb. To understand how to thrive from chaos, you need to understand the triad of fragility, robustness, and anti-fragility, which Taleb explains through three ancient myths. First, we have Damocles. Now, Damocles was a courtier who was tricked by the king into taking on the king's lifestyle, so getting all of his opulence, all of his wealth, all of his enjoyment, but sitting on the throne with a sword hanging above his head by a horse's hair. He had all the trappings of a rich, wealthy life, but he could have died at any moment. He was extremely fragile. Next, we have the phoenix. Now, the phoenix is famous because it cannot die. When it's killed, or if it passes away from old age, it doesn't actually die. It falls into ash, and then it's reborn from the ashes. The phoenix represents robustness, because nothing can kill it. And we often think that the opposite of fragility is robustness, but what the real opposite of fragility is, is anti-fragility. Now, Taleb explains anti-fragility with the myth of the Hydra, which you probably remember from the animated movie Hercules. And the Hydra, when one of its heads is chopped off, two grow back in its place. It is made stronger by bad things happening to it. What we want is to design a life where we don't just survive and endure chaotic events happening, we're able to turn them to our advantage. Throughout the book, Taleb expounds on this concept by explaining surprising ways we expose ourselves to fragility without knowing it, and ways we can adapt our life to become more anti-fragile and to always be able to thrive when faced with new challenges. One big area is the kind of work we do, because your job or your profession can determine a lot of the fragility that you have in your life. Being a lawyer might seem like a safe choice, but it's actually a fairly fragile profession. For one, you're always trading your time for money. If you stop working, or if you can't work for a period, you're not really going to make any money. And if you get fired, or the economy crashes, your firm goes under, and you can't work as a lawyer for whatever reason, well, that's the only thing you know how to do, and the only thing you're qualified to do, so changing into a new career is really tough. The last thing you want to do is have to start from scratch with hundreds of thousands of dollars in law school debt. If the world goes crazy and you're suddenly thrown out of your job, you're going to have a hard time responding to that. You're not diversified in your skill set or your source of income. For contrast, something like starting a YouTube channel is actually a fairly anti-fragile type of thing to do, because if you stop producing videos for a while, you could still be earning income from them. Uh, nobody can really take the job away from you unless YouTube shuts down or something, but then you can just move on to a new platform, and you're developing a lot of skills like video editing or uh, copywriting or scripting that you could use for other professions down the line. It's an honestly safer profession in some ways than getting a law degree. Another example Taleb gives in the book is that as an author, nothing that he does could make him sell fewer books. Even if he's getting bad publicity or good publicity or literally any kind of publicity, it's probably going to increase sales for him. So he's very anti-fragile to basically anything happening. If you're a mid-level executive employee at a big company and you punch out some asshole in the bar, you're probably going to get fired. But if you do that when you're an author, you're probably going to sell more books. So how do you position yourself to be more like the YouTuber or author and less like the lawyer? Well, one thing you can do is is try to optimize for optionality. The more options you have, the more freedom you have to respond to unforeseen circumstances, and the more flexible you can be to turn new situations to your advantage. Financial independence is a really big form of optionality, because the longer you can go without a paycheck, the more freedom you have to do what you want and take advantage of a new situation. That doesn't mean you have to be super rich, though. Simply knowing how to do some amount of freelance work is an incredible way to increase your financial optionality. Knowing that if you lost your main profession, you could make money on your own while you figure out your next move is a huge source of peace of mind and freedom to do what's going to be the best for you in the long term. There are other great ways to increase your optionality, like working on projects where even if they don't work out, you still have a lot of upside. Again, to use the YouTuber example, even if you know growing my YouTube channel doesn't work out, I'm learning a ton by doing this. I'm learning about videography, learning about photography, sound editing, I'm meeting a lot of really interesting people, and I'm getting to go through some of my favorite books again, which is always a good use of time. Going to parties is another form of optionality because you never know who you might meet and what could come of running into random people at them. 
Parties are kind of hard to go to during COVID, but hopefully we get that option back soon enough. Either way, if like entrepreneurial adventures or creating more options in your life is something you're trying to do, I talk about that a lot on this channel, so make sure you subscribe for future videos. Wherever you can, you definitely want to choose to optimize for optionality. And that goes beyond just your job choice too, because another great thing you can do is expose yourself to small stressors. Taleb makes the point that we've made ourselves soft and kind of weak by removing beneficial stressors in our life. We're never cold because we always have indoor heating. We're never bored because we have these amazing Using FOMO devices in front of us all the time. And we're never hungry because we never stop eating. We always have snacks and things available to us and we're eating three meals a day. It seems like we're doing a good thing by making our lives easier, but we're actually hurting ourselves by making ourselves weaker to changes in our routine. Taleb suggests finding small ways to expose yourself to stresses that will improve your life. One example is exercise. In the moment, exercise is challenging. It's stressing your body, potentially doing damage to it. But that positive stress actually makes your body stronger over time because it can respond respond to the exercise and make itself more able to handle that kind of exercise in the future. If you never stress your body in the short term, it will become weak in the long term. But if you give it those good stresses in the short term, in the long term it becomes stronger. Another good example is fasting. If you're somebody who gets hangry and you start to get kind of grumpy if you haven't eaten for a few hours, that's a sign that your dietary system's kind of weak and that you can't go for an extended period without eating. A third great example of the benefit of small stresses is language learning. Because if you're playing games on your phone, learning your language, you're not actually doing that much. Tlub suggests that the best way to learn a language is being in stressful environments where you really have to try to figure out what to say. Why you flat-nosed, little-eyed, flaky freak? <laughs> the two examples he gives are getting yourself thrown in prison or trying to pick up uh, people at a bar because in both cases, you're gonna have to work pretty hard to make sure you're figuring out the language and you're gonna be motivated to learn it really, really quickly. So small stressors are great and something you should try to find ways to incorporate more of in your life, especially when it comes to health and wellness stuff because another great topic to let touches on is iatrogenics or harm by the healer. Now, my grandmother-in-law grew up in rural China and her default advice for basically any low-level sickness is just drink some tea and it'll get better. Now, from a Western perspective, that seems a little, you know, silly and hokey. Right? Like, obviously, tea doesn't cure everything, but there is some ancient wisdom in there because if you just go to the doctor every single time you have something wrong with you, something bad could happen eventually. Medical error kills more people than any single cancer. It's a huge source of death, especially in the United States. And so if you're going to the doctor all the time, you're actually exposing yourself to additional risks that you wouldn't be exposed to if you just drank some tea every time you had a cold. We think of going to the doctor as this purely good thing that you should always do when you're feeling off, but there are always risks involved. It's almost impossible to predict the secondary consequences of an action. And especially when it comes to people who are trying to help, sometimes their desire to just do something over doing nothing ends up being bad for you. As a crazy example, my friend's dog fell from about 10 feet, and just a little dog, and uh, when he fell, he dislocated his leg and his leg was basically popped out, he couldn't walk, and so my friend had to try to take him to a vet. And she was running around, this is in the middle of COVID, so a lot of the vets were backed up, and by the time she finally found one that could take him, the surgeon had gone home for the day. So they said, sorry, we're gonna have to keep Theo overnight, and then we'll do the surgery in the morning. The next morning, she wakes up and she gets a call from them that Theo had managed to pop his leg back into place overnight, and they didn't need to do a surgery. Now, if they had done it, it would probably have been fine. But there's always a chance undergoing surgery and anesthesia that Theo could have died, right? Or he could have been seriously injured by it. Something could have gone wrong. And it turned out that the surgery wasn't necessary at all. Just letting him recover overnight, he managed to fix it himself. Now, obviously you should go to the doctor if you break your leg, right? I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that sometimes when somebody wants to help, they end up hurting. And we can't just assume that every attempt to help is always going to be a benefit. Sometimes it's better to just do nothing. So how does this affect you and what can you do with it? Try to avoid unnecessary interventions and try to to avoid the impulse to do something. We know that too much help can harm us in some areas, like a parent who's so afraid of their child falling that they never let them walk on their own. But we don't always understand that immediately seeking someone to help solve our own problems isn't helping us because we fall victim to another topic in the book called domain dependence. And domain dependence means that sometimes we understand something in one area, but then fail to apply that understanding in another. Many statisticians understand statistics, but then they get tripped up by clever news stories that are manipulating the numbers to tell a story. 
story. Or someone might study a bunch of mental models and biases and heuristics and understand them really well on a conceptual level, but still fall victim to them when they're out in the wild. Daniel Kahneman famously mentioned this on a podcast where he said that despite studying heuristics and biases and things for a lot of his life, he still gets tripped up by them just like anyone else. Understanding it in the academic domain doesn't mean that he's able to perfectly understand it and avoid it in the wild. Another classic example of this is what's called the gel man amnesia effect, where essentially you could read a newspaper story about something you understand really deeply, and you might think, that reporter doesn't really know what they're talking about. But then you turn the page and you start reading about something where you're less familiar with the topic, and you don't immediately discount what you're reading. You should recognize that if this newspaper didn't really know what it was talking about in this area you understood, it probably doesn't know what it's talking about in this area that you don't, but we forget. We don't transfer over that knowledge because of some domain dependence. The other reason that you know we can get tripped up by newspapers sometimes is their tendency to fit stories into what Taleb calls a Procrustean bed. Now the Procrustean bed concept comes from the myth of Procrustes, who would capture wandering travelers and then try to fit them into his bed. If they were too tall, he would shave off their feet and legs until they fit into the bed perfectly. If they were too short, he would put them on a rack and stretch them until they perfectly fit the bed. Taleb suggests that when we destroy variation to make something fit into a model, we're doing similar harm to ourselves and others. One simple example is the typical personal trainer at a gym. They're probably training people in 50 minute slots because that's very convenient for scheduling, but the ideal workout is probably not exactly 50 minutes. They're going to have to stretch or collapse what they think you should be doing in order to fit into that 50 minute slot. One thing I love about my gym central athlete that I go to is they don't prescribe an exact duration of the workout. They give you the workouts you need to do for that day, and then you go in and do them any time of day that you want for however long it takes. They've removed the procrustean and bed effect that happens in most personal training and given you that natural variation back. Another good example comes from Taleb's other book, The Procrustean Bed, where he says, We are changing the brains of school children through medication to make them fit to the curriculum rather than the reverse. Instead of realizing that if so many kids need to be on ADHD medication to get through school, we should probably change something about school. We're just putting more and more kids on drugs to make them conform to the system. Perfect Procrustean bed example. So avoid making unnatural changes to adjust to an unnatural situation and avoid stretching or collapsing something to fit into an unnatural position. And another great way to handle unnatural situations is to take a barbell approach to life. Taleb argues that we tend to expose ourselves to too much mid-level risk. And a good example of this would be having a you know retirement fund that's predominantly in stocks. Now, the most that can really go up in a year is maybe 10, 20%, which is great but it could also drop by 30, 40% in a year. So you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk for somewhat limited upside. Taleb suggests something kind of unconventional instead, where he says that you should put 90% of your net worth in extremely safe assets. So that could be cash, T-bills, something like that. And then the other 10% you put into extremely risky, highly volatile investments, like angel investing or buying stock options. The reason he says that is the most you could ever lose in that situation then is 10% of your net worth. But because you're investing in highly volatile assets with a chance to 10X, you could actually increase your net worth significantly more. You either do way better, so you have huge potential upside, or you know it doesn't go well and you have very limited downside. Another example of taking a bimodal or barbell approach would be spending 80 to 90% of your time on your day job, which can provide a nice steady salary, but then spending the other 10% of your time on more like moonshot type projects. So building an audience, building a blog, right? Something I've talked about a lot on this channel and you should definitely check out those videos if that's something you're interested in. But by spending most of your time on something safe and then 10% of your time on something riskier with very high potential return, you've got the best of both worlds. You have security and you have upside. Taleb also gives some other examples of uh, barbell style living that are pretty fun. So where he says, do crazy things like break furniture once in a while, like the Greeks do during the latter stages of a drinking symposium and then stay rational in larger decisions. Read trashy gossip magazines and classics or sophisticated works but never middle brow stuff like whatever's in the airport, probably. <laughs> uh, talk to either undergrad students, cab drivers and gardeners, or the highest caliber scholars. Never to middling but career conscious academics. Eat New York City dollar pizza or the best food you can buy. Avoid the middle. And when you are making choices, another thing you can do that helps is to think in terms of via negativa. 
Now, via negativa means removal instead of addition, because it's tempting when we're faced with a new problem to try to add something to it, when really we should maybe be taking something away. If you're super stressed out when you reach the end of the day, the best solution to that is probably trying to find a way to remove the main stressor. It's not to add alcohol or marijuana or something else to help relax you. It's always tempting to find something to add to our situation to fix a problem, when often the best answer is to take something away. If you want to eat healthier, one really simple way to do that is to just take away any foods that have been invented in the last hundred years. When you look at traditionally healthy populations that are introduced to McDonald's and vegetable oils and sugars and things like that, they tend to become unhealthy really quickly, which gives us a clue that maybe if we just take out all that stuff that we added to our diet in recent history, we could probably become healthier too. And Taleb also makes a great point about wealth, that a lot of living a rich life is not having to do things you don't wanna do, not having to go to meetings, not having to wait in lines, not having to worry about money, security, things like that. A lot of happiness comes from removing the stressors, removing the bad parts of life, not from adding shiny new things. There are so, so many great ideas in Anti-Fragile. It's easily one of my top five books I've ever read and everybody should pick up a copy. And if you like books like this that are just chock full of awesome wisdom, another great one to check out is The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, which I did another summary video on, kind of like this one. It should be popping up right around here. But Naval is extremely wise and shares a ton of wisdom on wealth, health, happiness, philosophy, and Nassim Taleb is one of his favorite authors. So if you liked the ideas in this book, you probably like some of Naval's ideas as well. So definitely check out that video next, and I'll see you soon.